Hey everyone, so welcome to the lecture on uh, the uh, WMDs and we're going to focus uh, specifically on uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, nuclear weapons, um, we're really entering into the world of deterrence. So nuclear weapons it theoretically could be used for uh, for multiple different uh, purposes, um, and and sometimes um, with certain countries we we see that they are. Um, so uh, they're uh, other than deterrence, they can be used for what's referred to as swaggering, a uh, swaggering, which uh, means uh, kind of getting uh, using it to to gain reputation. So in this case, if you see kind of any parade uh, with with missiles kind of uh, in a military parade, uh, showing them off to the world. This is trying to gain reputation, trying to uh, show your power, uh, kind of reputation on the cheap. Um, that's swaggering and that is the purpose of nuclear weapons given that these are high prestige weapons uh they, they're strong signals of, of status um but most of the time we're talking about deterrence so uh, we're going to start a little bit with deterrence what it is and then look kind of at some models of why states may acquire nuclear weapons uh, so deterrence is the deployment of military power so as to be able to uh, prevent an adversary from doing something uh, that one does not want him or her to do and that the other may otherwise be tempted to do by threatening uh, him or her with unacceptable punishment um, if, if it's done. Uh, deterrence is a threat of retaliation. So for example, if we're worried that a country may want to attack us, they're not currently attacking us, but we're worried in the future they may want to attack us, we could put out a deterrent threat saying, if you attack us, um, we will uh, punish you um, so severely uh, that it will not be worth the attack. Uh, so you're, you're threatening them with unacceptable punishment, not just some small punishment, but that you will make the, co uh, the cost very high. Um, so in the case of deterrence, uh, deterrence um, uh, is peaceful. Uh, deterrent threats usually are, are, are given in the time of peace, right? So it's not getting, it's not trying to get, uh, for example, a country that's already attacking you to stop. Um, that would be a different form of use of military power um, because it's trying to provoke a change in behavior. In the case of deterrence, it's trying to keep the status quo. So you're currently at peace with the country. You're worried that they may have an incentive to deviate from peace. And so you issue a threat of what will happen if they do so. Um, deterrence uh, can be targeted. So the threats of retaliation can be uh, targeted at, uh, at the military. Uh, but typically that went rise to unacceptable levels of, of punishment. So typically um, most deterrent threats uh, target population and or uh, critical industry of a country. So it's threat of destroying population centers, not military bases, not military hardware, but entire cities. So you could threaten to bomb, you know, New York, LA, Chicago, Houston, or, or Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, so holding the uh, the population hostage. Um, a credible threat requires that the other state believes that you have the will and capabilities to carry out the threat, right? So for someone to believe uh, for a deterrent threat to, to, to function, um, you have to, the other side has to be aware that you have the capabilities to carry out the threat. So if you make a, a threat that you will destroy the other country if they, uh, or you will destroy New York, LA, and Chicago if, if if the U.S. does something that you don't like. Well, the U.S. has to believe that you have the capabilities to actually destroy New York, LA, or Chicago, or else the threat's not capable. But you also have to have uh, they have to believe that you have the will, right? That you've got the resolve to carry out the threat. Uh, and so this was actually something uh, one of the, the lead um, questions during the Cold War period was how can you show that you'll have the resolve to carry out a threat, given that nuclear retaliation, nuclear war was probably going to destroy both sides. How could you threaten to take an action knowing that it was kind of mutual suicide? Um, so how could you bolster it in a way, particularly when it was dealing with protecting the allies? How could you credibly commit that if the Soviet Union attacked Paris um, or Brussels, um, that the United States would intervene, knowing that they'd lose, say, Boston to protect uh, Brussels. Um, so uh, th this was uh, what, one of the, the key questions uh, 
but just in general for deterrent threat, whether it's nuclear or otherwise, because deterrence can exist with conventional forces as well. Uh, you have to have the capability or believe to be uh, to have the capability and you have to be, uh, be believed to have the will to carry out the threat. Um, a deterrent threat by definition is a peaceful use of military power. So it's issuing of a threat. It's not actually using military force in and of itself. If force is ever has to be used, deterrence has failed because it means the threat wasn't believed um, or wasn't well issued. So it could be the threat was believed, but the punishment wasn't severe enough. So it wasn't actually a good threat of unacceptable damage, um, or it could have been a, a good threat of unacceptable damage, but they didn't believe that you had the will or the capabilities to carry it out. So how do, in both cases, uh, for defense and deterrence, the goal is typically to protect yourself. Most deterrent threats are about protecting homeland or allies or someone else. Defense has similar purposes, defending homeland or, uh, or others. So what, what is the difference between the two? Um, so the idea of both is to dissuade someone uh, from doing, uh, from taking an action that would be harmful. Uh, so again, in the case of a, 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 an attack, it would be to prevent another state from carrying out an attack that they may desire to do. Um, if they have no desire, then it's not really defense or deterrence, it's just kind of harmony of interest. Um, but if both sides, if the other side has some desire to attack, um, both, side, uh, both defense and deterrence are to dissuade it from carrying out this threat. Now, but they operate differently. Defense dissuades by convincing the others uh, that they cannot win militarily, right? So the, in the case of defense, it's saying, if you, you, you could try attacking us, but our defenses are strong enough that we will repel your attack and you will not achieve your goals. Um, deterrence dissuades by convincing their state that it will suffer unacceptable losses, even if it wins militarily. Um, so not necessarily saying if you attack, uh, so it's not saying that if it's attack, we will prevent you from achieving your goals. Um, it's saying if you attack, we will impose enormous costs on you that will make even a military victory, victory um, pale in comparison or make it still a loss. You could win militarily, but still feel like you lost. Um, so they're, they're separate in that uh, defense is possible without the ability to deter and deterrence is possible without the ability to defend, right? So you can, uh, you can defend and, and have the capabilities to repel any attack without having the capability to be able to um, inflict unacceptable um, costs on, say, uh, on enemy population centers. Um, and similarly, you could have zero defense and the other country could just walk in, but you could have strong um, weaponry for being able to uh, deter, uh, and meaning that even if they straight walked in, um, you could destroy uh, their cities. This is typically um, the case when we're talking with nuclear weapons at, uh, uh, separation. When, when we're talking conventional weapons, it gets a little bit more blurred. It could be difficult to deter when we're talking conventional conventional weapons without the ability to defend. Uh, there's, it's a little bit murkier there um, because you'd be using those same weapons that you would use to defend often for carrying out the re retaliation. And if they're all destroyed, then it, uh, it doesn't really work. Um, but generally speaking, you don't need the ability to do one to be able to do the other. Um, in, in fact, in the case of nuclear weapons, um, defense, at least in, in the nuclear realm, becomes uh, impossible. Um, many argue in the case of conventional weapons without nuclear weapons, deterrence is largely impossible. Uh, the reason deterrence is largely impossible with conventional weapons is that um, you, you'd be dealing often then, say, in modern times with, say, strategic air bombing, so uh, carpet bombing of cities. Um, to get to the level of damage to make it unacceptable requires a lot of capabilities and sustained bombing runs um, using bombers that can be, are easier to defend and against and shoot down, uh, making it just tremendously difficult. Uh, bar, so it's not necessarily difficult to believe that a, a country would have the will to do it, but to believe that they have the capabilities to do so, it becomes a very high threshold to meet. Uh, so typically, if we're talking conventional weapons, we're talking 
more having to lean on defense. When we're talking nuclear weapons, we're talking more having to lean on uh, deterrence. Uh, the ability to defend and or deter depends on the quantitative balance of forces. So how many weapons do you have and the qualitative balance of force, so the quality of weapons. So for example, uh, all else being equal, if we're talking defense, the side with more weapons um, is likely to win the conflict. So uh, the number of weapons you have to throw up in defense makes it more likely that you'll be able to defend. Similar to the quality of the weapons, uh, you may have fewer weapons, but if they're such high quality uh, weapons, um, they can you know, uh, overcome larger enemy forces with inferior weapons. Now, one of the issues that comes up, so I, I talked about when, when we're speak about nuclear weapons, that um, defense becomes difficult. Um, it, it, stopping nuclear weapons becomes very difficult. Um, and there's been, you know, multiple discussions over the decades of developing missile shields and defensive systems against nuclear weapons. Um, and they're very controversial and for two main reasons. Um, and it's interesting, normally just on the surface, we'd say anything that any defensive system should be a good idea. Uh, any defensive system if it makes us safer, what's the harm? When it actually comes to defense against nuclear weapons, um, it, it turns out that most scholars would actually say that it causes considerable harm. Um, so first, it's very difficult to achieve. Nuclear weapons are small and light. They're easy to move, easy to hide, and easy to deliver in a variety of different ways. Uh, even an unimaginably perfect defense against ballistic missiles would uh, fail to negate nuclear weapons. Such a defense would put a premium on the other side's ability to, develop, uh, to deliver nuclear weapons in different ways. So uh, firing missiles on depressed trajectories. So ballistic missiles take on a certain height and then come down. So if you, even if you had a ballistic missile defense, they could fire kind of cruise missiles, flatter trajectory, um, which would not be negated by a, a ballistic missile uh, shield. You may be able to develop a different shield against it, but that's a new weapon system in place. Uh, carrying bombs in suitcases, so suitcase bombs, placing nuclear weapon uh, wa uh, warheads on freighters to be anchored in, in harbors, uh, submarine launch missiles, uh, bomber runs, uh, which again wouldn't be... Um, now, many of these in general, so bomber runs, you could shoot down the bombers, uh, cruise missiles, you could probably develop systems to uh, shoot down cruise missiles. Um, the, the, the suitcases and, and, and shipping become much more difficult. But e even if we took out the suitcases and shipping and the other three, you could possibly develop uh, systems against. Um, a, you'd need perfect system for all three. Um, B, even when we're talking about the weapons uh, the, the quantities of weapons that some of these states have had in the in the tens of thousands. Um, so imagine we got a ballistic missile system that was 99% effective. Um, that's you know that would, for a weapon system, a defensive system, that would be really good. And think about what we're talking about when we're talking about ballistic missile defense. We're talking about a a, a missile that yes, it is fairly large, but in in, in the scheme of the sky is pretty darn small and we're talking about firing a projectile at it and hitting it while it's flying at immense speeds it's essentially trying to shoot a bullet out of the air with another bullet um and so we're talking very very difficult so if we could achieve 99 percent, you know that'd be pretty great but that still means if 100 missiles were fired one would get through so that's one city destroyed but you know, the US and Soviet Union had far more than 100. So imagine a thousand were fired. That's 10 cities destroyed. Uh, if 10, you know, if 5,000 missiles uh, were fired, that's still 50 cities destroyed. So um, e even at 99%, you know, effectiveness, we're, we're still dealing with probably unacceptably high damage um, and not something that we necessarily want to be relying on. Um, so incredibly difficult to achieve. Um, even if we could achieve it with one form of delivery, um, we probably, because of, you know, nothing's ever perfect, it still probably wouldn't be realistically useful 
because you know something would still get through. Um, and even if it were perfect, there's other ways of develop uh, of delivering nuclear weapons, given their yield and given the size of many countries. Um, it it would be something that could still reach the countries somehow. Countries could be creative in how they deliver it, um, and so it just becomes something that if you start looking at the practicalities, it's just not really practical. But beyond the practicalities, the bigger reason comes down to it's, it's actually destabilizing. Uh, in many ways, um, defense would actually, in, the, in this weird system of nuclear weapons, defense would actually make war more likely. Um, and the reason is that the logic of strategic defense becomes the logic of conventional weaponry. Conventional strategies pit weapons against weapons. That's exactly what a strategic defense would do, thereby recreating the temptations and instabilities that have plagued countries armed only with conventional weapons. If the US and Soviet Union, uh, you know, in their rivalry, deploy defense systems, each will worry, uh, no doubt, excessively about the balance of offensive and defensive capabilities. Each will fear that the other may score an offensive or defensive breakthrough, right? So you start get, kind of getting into this real worry. The nice thing with nuclear weapons with deterrence is once you get past the certain point of weapons, um, and as long as it doesn't become too lopsided, you don't have to worry too much who has exactly a little bit more, right? If one side has, you know, 1,500, one side has 1,000, well, guess what? Both have a, a survivable enough large force that no matter who stri strikes first, the other is going to have enough left over to cause unacceptable damage on the other one. And so you don't have to be kind of going through too much. Who's got the most? You could feel relatively secure. If we start getting into this uh, missile defense, you start worrying about, okay, how many defensive missiles does the other side have? Because I need to make sure I've got enough weapons to be able to get through it. Um, and so you start carrying, you start escalating in terms of armed racing, in terms of defensive weapons, in terms of offensive weapons. Whenever you start doing that, you start getting into situations where war is more possible. Um, but the other reason is that if one side were able to develop a missile shield, then the entire basis of nuclear deterrence that kept the peace say during the Cold War. A large reason for the peace during the Cold War was that both sides knew that if they went to war with each other, there was too high of a risk that it would escalate to nuclear war, and nuclear war just was mutually viewed as not acceptable, right? Just the costs were too high. Uh, destroying your entire civilization, you know, is pretty high cost. Um, but if one side knows that it cannot be attacked, then it can be free to do whatever it wants, right? If, for example, if the US had a perfect missile shield, then it doesn't mind starting a low-scale war with the Soviet Union. It doesn't mind escalating to war with the Soviet Union. It could start building up conventional weapons uh, to actually try to, you know, upset the balance of power, say, in Europe and have invaded the Soviet Union, and vice versa. Uh, if the Soviet Union had a missile shield, right, then they could have pushed into Western Europe, knowing that the U.S.'s threat of nuclear retaliation was no longer applicable. And so that if the Soviet Union could acquire stronger forces in Western Europe, it was free to start a, uh, or in Eastern Europe, on the border with Western Europe, it would be free to start an invasion. If both sides have missile shields, then deterrence just falls out, nuclear weapons become unusable, and we end up in a situation like in the past and probably, or quite possibly, could have ended up in World War III. Um, so because they removed deterrence, uh, the, uh, kind of the level of deterrence that makes nuclear weapons useful for preventing war, it puts us back into what we had before with the normal balance of power system. Um, and this normal balance of power system with conventional weapons is prone to falling into war. Um, so that is the main reason where, why many scholars and policymakers uh, don't support strategic defense. Now, who are the, the nuclear states? Um, well, we've got the, the P5, so the kind of the original five who, who over the, the, from the 1940s into the 1960s developed nuclear weapons. So the permanent five in the Security Council of the US, Russia, a successor to you know, Soviet Union, uh, the United Kingdom, France, and China. 
then in the 1990s, we had the uh, uh, India and Pakistan uh, develop um, uh, weapons at uh, the same time, kind of in response to each other. Um, Israel, hard to say exactly when Israel got it because Israel has this um, strange for anywhere else, but probably makes sense for Israel um, structure of nuclear opacity, meaning that uh, everybody knows that Israel has nuclear weapons, but Israel doesn't come out and say it. Um, and, and the reason that this, this is strictly strange is that typically for deterrence to work, the other side has to know you have some capabilities. So not coming out and flaunting that you have nuclear weapons seems strange from a deterrence standpoint. Um, so it's strange that Israel, in, from that perspective, wouldn't just parade them around and say, hey, this is what we've got. Um, but um, Israel's also worried about provoking regional, other states in the region from developing nuclear programs of their own or nuclear weapons of their own. Um, so new, uh, Israel kind of struck this kind of in-between. Everybody knows we've got it, so, uh, stands up. Everyone knows we've got it, so we have deterrence still, but we're not flaunting it so that possibly others won't feel like they need to get it in response. It's not this publicly, we're out there as a nuclear state. Uh, and then North Korea, with a, a limited capability, but a growing capability, uh, developing in the, the 2010s, uh, in the last decade, uh, entered into the nuclear club. Um, other states have had nuclear programs, um, but aborted them short of actually developing nuclear weapons. Uh, the Ukraine did have nuclear weapons uh, for a brief time, uh, but in the 1990s gave them up. Uh, the Ukraine uh, had weapons as a nuclear successor state to the uh, Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, a, a sizable portion actually of the Soviet Union's nuclear forces were located on Ukrainian territory. Um, so Ukraine actually had those nuclear weapons, um, but in a trade for security and, and resources, um, agreed to give them up in the early 1990s. So why do states develop nuclear weapons? And there, there's three models that Sagan developed, a security model, a domestic politics model, and a norms model. So we'll look at each very, very briefly. Um, so to start the security model, um, so um, George Schultz uh, wants to summarize the argument. Uh, so uh, US kind of foreign policy uh, expert uh, Schultz uh, summarized the argument, pro proliferation begets proliferation. So spread, causes more spread. Every time one state develops nuclear weapons to balance against its main rival, it also creates a nuclear threat to another state in the region, which then has to initiate its own nuclear weapons program to maintain its national security. From this perspective, one can envision the history of nuclear proliferation as a strategic chain reaction, right? So one state feels insecure, it develops nuclear weapons, right? That state's rival now feels insecure, so it develops nuclear weapons of its own. That state's other rival, uh, so, or let's say state A feels insecure, so it develops nuclear weapons, right? State A's rival, state B, now feels insecure, so it develops nuclear weapons. State B's other rivals, now feeling insecure, develop nuclear weapons in response. Uh, so state, let's call that state C. State C's other rivals feeling insecure, so on and so forth. So, for example, in, in this scenario, um, the, uh, let's say China develops nuclear weapons, right? Because it's feeling insecure, you know, the United States has nuclear weapons, Soviet Union has nuclear weapons, uh, but particularly at that time, the US has nuclear weapons, so China's feeling insecure. Um, India then could look at China's weapons and say, hey, we've had wars and border skirmishes with China. We're not so thrilled about China having nuclear weapons. So India is like, oh, let's develop nuclear weapons. Then Pakistan, India's, uh, biggest rival looks and says, hey, we're not, we're, we've been fighting a lot of wars against India. We're not so keen on India having nuclear weapons. So let's get nuclear weapons of our own. Uh, you could see a similar kind of logic that could take place. You could tell a story about what could take place uh, in the Middle East. So Israel has nuclear weapons. Um, this is certainly something that has provoked Iran to look at nuclear weapons program and has this on again, off again nuclear weapons program. Um, if 
Iran were to develop nuclear weapons, well, Iran's uh, biggest regional rival would be Saudi Arabia. So if Iran were to develop nuclear weapons, you could certainly see that, uh, not to say that they would, but you could certainly, from this perspective, you would have guessed that Saudi Arabia would look into a nuclear weapons program of its own or um, getting kind of a formal security guarantee from another nuclear state. Then Saudi Arabia's other rivals, right, could look at getting a program, so on and so forth. To, and go through that full chain until you hit a state that just doesn't have the capabilities for acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, in this case, we, we should expect wide proliferation among states who have the capability for getting it. Um, since we don't necessarily have wide proliferation, we a decent number of states, but not many, that would show that there's some limits to the security model, but some a, a good portion of the trajectory too of nuclear development, you know, the US got it and then Soviet Union got it. And then after Soviet Union, you've got like UK and France getting it. Uh, and so it, it is a lot of kind of the different rivals responding to rivals getting it. We do see that element of chain reaction, uh, chain reaction there. Um, second reason, so that, uh, we've got um, after the security model, we've got the domestic politics model. Uh, and the domestic politics model focuses on domestic actors uh, who encourage or discourage government from pursuing the bomb. Whether or not acquisition of nuclear weapons serves the national interest of a state, it's likely to serve the uh, parochial, bureaucratic, or political interests of at least some individual actors within the state. Um, so if we want to understand beyond the security model, why some states who may have, so there's been some states who have um, gotten nuclear weapons who it doesn't necessarily make sense from a security perspective in terms of this chain reaction. They weren't necessarily responding to a rival who've had it. So it didn't necessarily make sense from that context. Um, similarly, um, you may have, um, so a state who based on the security chain reaction, we should assume would develop nuclear weapons who didn't. And so if you want to explain those events, the domestic politics model can make sense. And this would say that within any state, whether they have you know, the security interests or not for developing nuclear weapons, some in uh, domestic society would like to have a nuclear weapons uh, program because they get, um, it would benefit them and some would not like nuclear weapons programs because it doesn't benefit them from their own domestic interests. So if you're likely to gain resources from a nuclear weapons program, then you're likely to like the idea of a nuclear weapons program and push for it. If you're likely to, if your organization is likely to lose resources from a nuclear weapons program, then you're likely to oppose it. And so then it comes into this bureaucratic politics bargaining model of all of these different actors pushing and it then goes into this bargaining process like we saw uh, with the uh, bureaucratic politics model. Um, so who are the domestic actors who would typically um, we think of liking nuclear weapons programs? Uh, so first, the state's nuclear energy establishment, uh, which includes officials in state-run uh, uh, labs as well as civilian reactor facilities, right? Anybody who's working in the nuclear energy establishment knows that um, it, nuclear weapon programs is likely to bring extra resources to the entire nuclear establishment. Um, if you're a nuclear expert, if the nuclear industry is growing, this is likely to bring increased resources, increased jobs, increased prestige uh, to your own organizations. Um, important units within the professional military, often within the Air Force, though sometimes in Navy bureaucracies, uh, interested in nuclear propulsion. Um, so some in the military know that it you know, nuclear programs, if they're to gain control over it, a lot of money goes into them. And so if you're going to be the ones in control of these nuclear programs, that's going to be bringing a lot of resources um, into, um, into your organization. So typically, in many countries, nuclear programs are housed within the Air Force. Many of them are developed, are delivered either through bombers or through missile forces. Um, and so Air Forces typically have a large amount of control over the nuclear programs. Um, and so many in the Air Force viewing increased resources, increased prestige coming to them favor nuclear weapons programs. Some in the Navy, um, so um, many Navy ships have nuclear propulsion uh, in modern uh, military, so nuclear programs um, can be beneficial. Also some, in some countries, some nuclear weapons are delivered by the Navy in the form of submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, so 
that element of development can be advantageous for the Navy as well. Um, so they may favor it as well. Armies typically never or don't really touch nuclear weapons. Um, and so army bureaucracies would probably typically oppose nuclear weapons because they would see a shifting if there's a limited pie of resources for the military. And a lot is going to the Air Force and some to the Navy for developing nuclear weapons programs. This means that there's less remaining for, for the army for its own needs. Um, also, if a military is based on deterrence, um, this leaves less need for war fighting capabilities potentially and so a de kind of um, prioritization of, of the army. Uh, and then finally, politicians in states or provinces or locations or regions in which uh, individual, individual parties or the mass public strongly favor nuclear weapons ac acquisition. Um, so it, this could be either if the public opinion in your location is heavily for um, nuclear weapons for whatever reason, um, or often in this case, if local industry. So for example, if you're located in a region, imagine if Canada was contemplating a nuclear weapons program, and if a nuclear weapons program were to be developed, it would be developed in Quebec. Let's just say it would be developed in Quebec. Then you would imagine that Quebec politicians seen that a number of jobs would high tech jobs, good paying jobs would come to Quebec with this development, many politicians in Quebec would probably favor it because the population would like the idea of the jobs um, and uh, it would be good for, for them to be able to show the population they're bringing the jobs locally. Um, those who are likely to lose jobs in other regions who wouldn't be getting anything would be less likely to support it. Then finally, the norms model. Um, and so all different, uh, uh, um, whenever it comes to different weapon systems and different military postures, there's certain norms about appropriate behavior. Um, and so this focus, the norms model focuses on norms concerning weapons acquisition, seeing nuclear decisions as serving important symbolic functions, both shaping and reflecting a state's identity. According to this perspective, state behavior is determined not by leaders' cold calculations about the national security interests or their bureaucratic interests, but rather by deeper norms and shared beliefs about what actions are legitimate and appropriate in international relations. Right. So what are the norms about nuclear ac uh, acquisition? So for example, there's a strong uh, uh, non-proliferation -pro regime centered around the non-proliferation treaty, right? So there's a strong belief now that um, states should not, other than those who have nuclear weapons, and even they, according to the regime, are supposed to work toward getting rid of them, the strong um, norm of behavior now that states should not develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and we see tremendous pushback on the recent states that haven't been developing it in terms of North Korea. Um, most states in the world oppose North Korea developing nuclear weapons. It was kind of viewed as being rogue for doing so. Uh, many countries uh, push back against Iran for its perceived nuclear programs. Uh, India and Pakistan received some punishment or some pushback when in the 1990s they developed their nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, because of this norm of this isn't something that we should be doing. Um, there's other norms that exist as well, particularly um, early on. So that could explain why some states would be more hesitant to develop nuclear weapons now. Um, earlier on, um, nuclear weapons were also kind of perceived as a signal of strength, of great power status, right? So all the different great powers were developing nuclear weapons. So if you want the signal, you're a great power. If you believe that you're a great power, if you had the identity or the belief that you should be viewed as a great power, um, then this would be viewed as an important symbol of that status. And if you didn't have it, it would look like something that wasn't fitting with, um, with, with, your, uh, with your desire. Uh, or with how you viewed yourself, right? Um, so you could develop nuclear weapons as a symbolic signal to others of we are great powers. We belong in the great power club. We have this marker of being a great power. 
Um, and so you could see it being developed in, in some cases by that. And you could also see some resistance to give it up in terms of if this is still a signal of being a great power, if we give it up, does that mean that we're saying, hey, if we're France and we give up our nuclear weapons, that's signaling that we don't really view ourselves as a country who needs nuclear weapons as one of the great powers who have larger international responsibilities or someone who now is under somebody else's security, right? From that perspective, we would see that France probably would, would not look kindly on giving up nuclear weapons or the UK um, or, or another state. Um, and so th this fits with, uh, so there's multiple different norms that could exist around proliferation. Um, and these will shape depending on your position. So for example, there could be multiple norms. If you're a great power, this is a norm of behavior. If you're anybody else, this is a norm of behavior. Norms can also shift across time. So for example, the non-proliferation regime would have strengthened over time, leading you know, early on many states, uh, including non-great powers had nuclear weapons programs. Most of those now have don't have nuclear weapons programs anymore. Very few states now have nuclear weapons programs. Um, and maybe you could probably see that kind of tracking with the increase in the non-proliferation regime. Um, now, there are multiple states who are viewed as latent nuclear proliferators. And uh, this doesn't mean that they have a, a nuclear, uh, a nuclear um, uh, program, um, but it means that they rapidly could develop nuclear weapons. So for example, based on the technology and the resources that Canada has, Canada does not have a current nuclear weapon program. We haven't had a nuclear weapons program in decades. But based on the scientific know-how, uh, know uh, the uh, technological resources available, so the equipment available within Canada, and the, uh, the fissile material available within Canada, if Canada decided that it needed nuclear weapons, it could develop nuclear weapons within very short order. Um, that falls out, though, of the, these proliferation models because you don't actually have to do anything towards becoming towards proliferator proliferation to be a latent nuclear proliferator. All right, that's all for uh, for uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so hope that uh, you enjoyed the the lecture.